Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day. Amen. There are some questions that are just awful hard to answer. Uh, for example, when does it cease being partly sunny and become partly cloudy? I once had a child ask me, can you cry while underwater? <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. One of the oxymoronic statements that drives me nuts is new and improved. <laughs> Think about it. How can it be new and improved? If it's new, you can't improve upon it. And if it's been improved, how is it new, Claudia? There are some times where it's hard to answer a question. Sometimes children, as Jennifer's about to find out in a few years, are going to start to ask you questions, and you're not going to know what to say. It's okay. Then you have politicians. Have you followed the Republican or Democratic debate? They are masters at not answering a question they don't want to answer, aren't they? And then, even as the facilitator tries to refocus them back on target, they'll just manage to refocus off of it. Masters of it, I tell you. Jesus makes them all look like amateurs. Because he has the ability to refocus. Now, in the case of Christ, he's not trying to avoid questions. He's just asking us to go deeper. To look beyond the surface question. To what's underneath it. This passage this morning is Christ the King Sunday. This is the lectionary passage for the day. And in this, Jesus has been arrested by the Jewish leaders. Taken a hair and now brought to Pilate. It's time for Pilate to interrogate him. Pilate's the governor, and Jesus is up on the charge of treason, in essence. And so he is asked, Are you the king of the Jews? What does Christ say? Did, did you make this up or did someone put you up to it? That's the new Clint Revised Version. <laughs> did somebody put you up to this? And what does he say? Am I a Jew? He's not a Jew. He's Roman. Am I a Jew? Then Christ says, my kingdom is not from this world, from this place. For if it were, my disciples would have taken up that and they would have protected me from being arrested. Ah, so you are a king after all. Well, you say that I am. But again, Jesus is always going to the deeper level. It's not about Christ being king. He's far more than a king in the sense that we would think of him. He then goes on to say, I have come here to testify to the truth. And anyone who listens to me will hear the truth. Will hear the truth. It's much more than just this issue of kingship. Pilate, I think, gets a bad rap at times. He was the governor of Palestine at the time, Israel. Bad things are happening. There's a potential for an insurrection. And this man is brought to him, Jesus, with the charge of being a king. There's a threat. Because if he were a king, he could lead an insurrection, a civil war, riots could break out, bad things could happen. So Pilate goes digging to try to find out what's going on. Jesus never denies his kingship. But in the midst of it, Herod and Pilate and the Jews and even the disciples don't seem to get it. They all expect Jesus to become a king in the traditional sense. They don't get it. Even the disciples, remember the disciples? They were there with him every day. What do they do when Jesus is nailed up on the cross? Except for one or two, perhaps. Feet don't fail me now, I'm out of here. And even on Easter morning, when he comes back to life, Peter and John just can't believe it. They just can't believe it until they actually see the risen Lord. They don't get it. It is much, much bigger than this kingship 
of Jesus that so many are concerned about. Jesus says to you, listen to him. For he tells the truth. He testifies to the truth. 2,000 years ago, people were making up their own truth in their own way. Some followed Rome. Some followed the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Some followed other leaders. There were lots that would point to their own truths. And Christ is saying, I know the real truth. I testify. Point to it. Listen to me. But the problem of Rome 2,000 years ago is still present today. And it's perhaps even more poignant today than it was then. We often talk about the baby boomers. A bunch of us in this room are boomers. Yeah. But there's another group that's followed us. And they are the millennials. If you were born with, yeah, okay, you can, you can amen me there, Jennifer, it's okay. If you're born between 1980 and 2000, you are a millennialist. You're the millennials, big group. Now, by the way, I need to just point out, if you are over 40 in this room, you, my friends, are an immigrant in a foreign land. We are outnumbered by the millennials and by their successors. And they're having babies. We are outnumbered. When you look at the millennials, they are wonderful people. And you have to be very careful not to paint everybody with the brush stroke. Because when sociologists look at a large group, everybody does not believe the way the sociologists see it. It's just there are trends. And in the millennial group, sociologists will teach us that they say they are spiritual but not religious. Spiritual but not religious. Oh, they may believe in God, they believe in Jesus, may believe in Buddha or some other faith, but will not consider themselves religious. If you dig deeper though, 65% not all, 65% will say they have rarely, and rarely being defined as they can't remember when, or never have attended worship. Stop. Did you get that number? 65% say they have rarely, meaning they can't remember when, or have never attended worship. How can you be spiritual and never have worshipped God? question. It's a concern. By the way, side note, added benefit, not in the sermon notes. What does worship mean? Worship means to give. I am very troubled when people on a Sunday morning go to church and they say, boy, I get a lot out of church. I'm going to go to church this morning. Or they leave afterwards and they say, boy, I got a lot out of that worship service. If you leave saying, I got a lot out of it, we have, we have failed. Because it is not about what you get out of worship, but rather what you give. Definition. It is worship. What we give to God. So 65% have never attended worship or cannot remember having attended worship. Challenge. The same 65% reported that they do, not, they do not pray. Do not pray. 65% also reported that they have not read any form of sacred text. Bible, writings of Buddha, Hindu, etc. Now I need to beg the question. How do you build a spiritual relationship if you are not reading the Word of God. How do you build it? Some in that group will tell you, well, I just believe that way. I believe that God is like this and this is what God would do. Well, great. Tell me more. What made you come to that conclusion? Well, nothing. I just believe that way. Friday, I went fishing. Well, oh, great day. You get thirsty in the middle of the day. And if I believe the Gulf of Mexico is fresh water. 
and dip my cup in it and take a drink from it, what am I going to experience? Salt water. Salt water. And by the way, where we were, it wasn't even brackish. It was salt. You know, got home and the cat just wanted to lick me. I had to keep smacking her away. <laughs> it's salt water. You can say and believe that it is fresh water all you want, but it remains salt water. There are some things that are true. There are some things that are absolutely true. And no matter what we do, we cannot change them. Christ is saying, I call you to the truth. And whoever listens to me hears the truth. But therein comes the challenge. It's hard to hear and listen. Um, in seminary, I had to take classes in pastoral counseling. And, and even when I was in management training with the government, I took classes in being a good supervisor and manager, and they taught us active listening. Any of you taken any of those classes? Yes, yeah, Steve put his hand up. A bunch of teachers, they teach there as well. And active listening. Because you see, if, if, if I'm sitting here and, and, and I'm talking to Chuck, and Chuck says three or four words to me, after about three words, what does my brain begin to do? Not just one. It doesn't want it. It does what? Thinks about what I'm going to say back. So those first three words, I'm hearing him. But then after that, my mind begins to think of what I'm going to say back. In the case of a husband and wife, it generally takes one word, but that's okay. <laughs> so, so here we are, and, and, and I'm beginning to think about what I'm going to say, and while I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, what happens to what he is saying? It gets lost, and I do not hear it. So they call it active listening. Now, one of the tricks they teach you, which will absolutely drive your husband or your wife nuts if you're in an argument, is Chuck says something to me, and then what I say to Chuck is, so what I hear you say is, and I repeat it back, if you use that in the midst of an argument, you're in trouble. But, but in terms of talking to somebody else, the purpose of that in counseling is to help me fully hear what the other person's saying and to make sure that they know that I've got it. Make sense? You can't just passively do it. So the question becomes, are we actively listening to Jesus Christ? Do you want to know the truth? Listen to Christ, he says. I testify to the truth, but we must be active in our listening. If we are not praying, and listening during our prayer, how can we ever hear? How many of us go to the Lord in prayer with a gimme, 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 gimme list? Lord, I'm sick. Lord, I've got this problem. My friend of mine's in trouble. By the way, the finances are not so good. Oh, good Lord, you wouldn't know what that little baby did at one o'clock in the morning, and I just can't get any sleep. How much time do we spend thanking God? How much time do we spend giving to God? How much time do we just pause and listen and not grab our iPad or iPhone or computer and play a game? Pause and listen. In worship, do we come with the attitude of what I'm going to give to the Lord? How I'm going to listen to the Lord speak? Or do I come with the attitude of what I'm going to get to take home with me? Even in small groups, we can gather together and be really, really thrilled with what we said and not pay any attention to what everybody else is saying to us. But at the core, if we are listening to God, if we really want to know God and know Jesus and know the Holy Spirit, the act of listening must occur. And there's only one way to truly learn the truth, and that is to read God's Word, the Bible. I love that picture. Isn't that great? I got to tell you, I've probably one out of 50 times gone to visit someone's house. They knew I was coming. But I get to the door, maybe just two or three minutes early, I ring the doorbell. And somewhere in the house, behind the curtains, you'll hear. 
this will be the coffee table. If you stick your head in and you look, you'll see them. And then they open the door. And you'll look at the Bible, and on the Bible, you will find fingerprints from where they had dropped it because they didn't do this first. The Bible doesn't do any good if it's gathering dust on it. If we want to know God's Word, we have to read it. By the way, you got to read the Bible. If you try to read this like a biology textbook or a math textbook, you're in trouble. It's not a science book. It's God's message to you and me. And it's intended to be very personal. Starting on January 1, we are going to invite each and every one, even you, Jennifer, who's up in Greenville, North Carolina, you can do this. Dad can make sure you do it, okay? Uh, we're going to invite every one of you to do something special. In 2016, read the Bible. Oh, gosh. That's a big, huge book. I haven't read that much since I went to college or high school. Relax. It's 66 books. <gasps> 66 books! Now you have me read 15 minutes a day. Just 15 minutes a day. That's it. That's all it's going to take you. Wait a minute. My eyesight's going bad. I can't see it. Let me introduce you to this wonderful thing called the Bible on tape or the Bible on CD or the Bible on DVD. Oh, by the way, did you know that you can even get it on your, your little phone or your little iPad or your iPod and you can stick an earbud in it and sit there and listen to it while you walk. Oh, did you know you can even play it through the radio in your car and on the 15 minute drive to work every day, get it done. Because you've got 15 minutes on your way to work, you've got another 15 minutes on the way home to listen to it again just in case you didn't get it right. I'm not me. I'm not going that far. But can we go through the Bible in one year? And the thing is, is in reading the Bible, you're not taking Clint's word for the truth. You're not taking Amy or Rachel's word for the truth. You're not taking for the truth what someone else in this congregation says or doesn't say. You go to the word that was inspired by God himself and indeed is filled with words from the Holy Spirit to speak to you and me, to tell me the truth. Now someone in here is going to say, oh Clint, I was here 10 years ago when Cypress Lake did this in, 19, or in 2006. I read it then. I don't need to read it again. Well, let me say something. If you can remember everything that you read 10 years ago, I want to take a vacation next Sunday. I'll take the day off, and you're welcome to preach. Because I'll tell you, I've gone to seminary. I've read this thing a whole bunch of times, lots of it in Greek and Hebrew, and I don't know about Pastor Carroll. But I sure as Dickens can't remember all of it. Every time I read it, it speaks new. And it speaks fresh. So in 2016, we're going to invite you to come along on a journey. Jesus was pointing to the truth. I testify to the truth. And that is so very, very important. Soren Kierkegaard, though, gave us a warning. Be very, very cautious, though. Because as you begin to read the truth, it is very easy to start to live out what Christ has told us to do. You know, if I just make a few more of those Operation Christmas Child boxes next year, maybe I'll be a little closer to God and God will look favorably upon me. Maybe if I just do a little more at the food pantry or volunteer a little more at Super Kids Club or sing in the praise band and the choir and help with the, the children at Angels Rock, then I'll be just a little closer to God and I'll be, be a little holier. And the truth is Jesus Christ. To know Jesus and to be drawn closer to Jesus and out of that relationship with Jesus to do all those other things. You see, it's about getting outside of ourselves and focusing on the maker, not on the creation. This coming Thursday presents a real challenge to many people in our country today. To us as Christians, it's easy. But to many, Thanksgiving Day has lost its real meaning. It's become one of the football games. Eating turkey, good stuff. 
Black Friday. And of course, you can now go to Walmart or wherever on Thanksgiving Day itself. I am so opposed to that on so many levels. But there's something that's even more dangerous. Some folks have gained the attitude of, you know, I went to work. I went to college, I earned my degree, I went to work, I worked hard, I earned all that money, and so now this house that I live in, this food that I have, and every single thing that I have, I worked for and I earned. Well, there may be a little bit of truth to that, but isn't there a lot of truth that's by the grace of God that we were born in this country, or born in a free country if it wasn't the United States? Wasn't it by the grace of God that we had our health, had our intelligence to be able to learn? Wasn't it by the grace of God that we were placed in the right educational institutions with the right parents and the right teachers? All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. It's moving beyond saying thank you to me, but saying thank you to God through Jesus Christ. My heavens, there is nothing that I have that God could have withheld, or furthermore, that God could take away that fast. Thanksgiving Day is about saying, thank you, God, for what you have given to me. It's about the truth that God, through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has changed all of our lives and blessed us immeasurably. That's the truth. Get to know Jesus Christ. Come closer to Him. Listen to Him. Act and listen to Him with prayer, with worship with reading his word. Don't take my word for it. Read his and be amazed at the results. Thanks be to God.